across the street from the condominium that I lived in for 30 years. His offices were right behind the bar where Manolo, a character in my recent novels, rediscovered the beauty of the world. Plum lived in the middle of a tropical forest, just a few steps from one of those third or fourth rate streets of ours that have, at first plan, nothing to recommend them but vulgarity and urban chaos. I was always fascinated by the mute dialogue between the architect whose house spoke of the Caribbean tropics as natural vegetative abundance and that street which spoke of the Caribbean tropics as people. Commercial activity, a hodgepodge of anonymous architectural styles, a motley mix of loud, vulgar, incoherent eclecticisms. Henry Clum lived on the Calle de Diego in the Sagarayana sector of Rio Piedras at the corner of Ramon B. Lopez, just down the street from the Lopez y Cardo public housing project. I wonder if it ever entered his mind to design something for that street, something that could be built on that street. One of the most pressing dialogues of, in this post-bootstrap period has been, of course, the one between the, architectur <coughs> the architectural traditions of the Caribbean region as a whole and architectural modernism. Henry Tom was, without question, one of the first to propose and enter into that dialogue, as well as one of his foremost interlocutors, as were Miguel Ferrer, Osvaldo Toro, and before them, Rafael Camuega in the University of Puerto Rico. In the University of Puerto Rico, <coughs> Tom was privileged to be given a space granted to him out of the enlightened despotism in the classical sense of the word of Jaime Benitez, where he was able to design almost organically that complex that always strikes an uneasy balance between city and monastery, a university campus. There, Colm engaged in a gentle conversation with the architects who designed the campus of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and especially with the great Carmuega. I think it is conversation between provincial modernism passed through the Hispanophilia of Spanish revival, on the one side, and on the other, modernism a la right whose ambition was to incorporate into his designs that sense of specificity, sense of place, that all great architecture manifests. The long conversation on the Rio Piedras campus may be one of the most eloquent examples of the course the international styles take in the provinces. But there's something very clear, yet often overlooked, that I want to point out to you. While the quadrangle designed by Carmuega, <coughs> this <laughs> photographs here are of the modernism that eventually evolves. This is La Concha on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is a great Hilton of the Toro Ferre uh, signature. <coughs> uh, these are the images of the Puerto Rico that was before the Puerto Rico that was later built. And in a sense, it is very interesting to see the contradictions and wherein lies the possibilities of the reinterpretation of that uh, heritage. This is a very special Puerto Rico. Edgardo's words are particularly relevant. Thank you, Gracias. <clears throat> to all who know and have visited Puerto Rico on the subject of Henry Klong, Edgardo adds, Maybe Henry Klum was right to not look at De Diego. The incoherence would have staggered him. And I mean that literally. On that street, you could find the ranch-style ranch house, Chick by Joe, with a Caribbean house of white porches, galleries, and gables, a wooden house next door to one with fundamental stone <clears throat> facing the anonymous architecture. This is more of our Puerto Rican tradition. Uh, of the anonymous architecture of the Master Mason with its wide overhangs and its porches, porch balustrades of molded concrete, along the surprising design of the great Linis, Pastrana's mango tree, one of the best restaurant designs ever seen in Puerto Rico with its circular dining room and its galvanized sink roof rising, climbing into the lower branches of that magnificent mango tree. That incoherence, as we've seen, stems from the cohabitation. If I may be pardoned that somewhat suggested metaphor of ancestral 
features with recent acts of forgetfulness and neglect. Picardo's words establish the framework for my search in architecture. The discourse applies to all of my work. However, the monograph at hand dwells primarily on design representative of the last 10 years, so as to avoid the temptation of producing a mini coffee table book. Nonetheless, a listing of all my projects, all 200 of them, is referenced at the end. From the very beginning, it is evident the work herein presented is informed by Puerto Rican vernacular architecture, even though the early work dates from the years in which high modernism was in vogue. And <clears throat> you can start seeing the evolution through the Normandy. The search for humanist vocabulary sidestepped the fashionable modernist architecture in exchange for tropical architecture that embraced our architecture of years past. The focus of the vernacular architecture that preceded modernist architecture went hand in hand with two concurrent fortuitous events for me. <coughs> On the one hand, <coughs> high modernism was already being questioned in the early 60s, with such treatises as Robert Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction of 1966, 45 years ago, giving way to postmodernism with its search for the traditional vocabularies. And on the other hand, my first exposure to building architecture in Puerto Rico came through my early insertion into the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture's Office of Historic Zones and Monuments. There, I was to dive head first, head and soul, into the vernacular architecture of Puerto Rico. The languages of traditional architectures, with their heavy overhangs, ornamental <coughs> screens, blocks, pergolas, high inclined roofs, tropical ventilators under the wooden ceiling overhangs, not to mention our medio puntos, <coughs> or interior space articulations, um, <coughs> which was the image actually that we saw. I uh, went a little fast there of the medio punto in that uh, lovely house interiors. <coughs> expands on the early findings that framed and anchored and contextualized my work. In order to best understand the need for the contextualization and the humanization of work of architecture, I would like to refer back once again to Ricardo Rodriguez Julia and his words at the Quantum Ceremony. The best literature, like the best architecture, is that which situates us and gives us a sense of place, of atmosphere. All great literature has a sense of place, of setting. These words, 40 years later, best embody and state the early search in retrospect of my architecture vis-a-vis -vis his search to render good literature. Edgardo's special narrative ultimately constitutes the path leading to identity needed to perceive good architecture. Herein lies the poetry of architecture and the ensuing rendering of enriched habitable space. <coughs> this monograph of the work carried out by the design studio over the years focuses on the conceptual context that has guided the architecture and on the experiences that informed the projects before presenting the less known recent work. Somewhat provocatively, the presentation of recent projects really gazed the graphic aspects of good architectural photography to second place and focuses instead on presenting the projects within the framework of the raison de ser and the pictorial or sculptural qualities. It would be a distortion to neglect the role that the architecture sisters have played in shaping of architecture, given that the intention here is to present the projects within their spatial, social, and cultural context. Every poem, every musical piece can be shown to have an architectural order or form. Thus the search for such poetics of space with a corresponding attempt to conceive and realize the project's structure, sense of place and depth, and the synthesis of these elements as humanistic constitutes a special narrative that architecture translates into three-dimensional form. The ensuing <coughs> then form then becomes <coughs> a manifestation of the architect's goal of habitability. The building as the inhabitant's second scheme, transcending the specific functions of design. The functionality of the qualitative design program must not overshadow the goal of maximizing the qualitative sense of shelter of the primary user with a yet higher goal of serving tertiary users. 
I selected this as a uh, interesting to me at any rate seminals in a way sample of the work that I have wanted to do. On the center is the old church of a small town Aguas Buenas in Puerto Rico. That was torn down and gave way to what I consider the monster on the right. That monster established pretty much the parameter of value in architecture at a given time of high modernism in Puerto Rico. My displeasure with that work was such that at one point we were asked to do a chapel for a cemetery design in Aguas Buenas, and I went back to find the old church so that it, in a way it could become the inspirational source for over to the left, the chapel that I designed to pay some respect to the collective memory of the place. I hope that we're not too far away from the awakening of the possibility of the demolition of the job on the right <laughs> to at some point whether it's within this context of the left or some other habitable form of space, be able to prioritize the human being, scale, and the habitability of a work so that we can learn from what initially the humility of an architecture put to the service of their people. <clears throat> it is a response to the context of the tropics that produces a regional and Caribbean architecture. This Caribbean architect, the Caribbean architect should always pursue the optimal way to inhabit the tropics at a given historical moment. That said, if there's one condition that distinguishes the architectural effort, it is the absence of artificially climatized or air-conditioned spaces, with the employment instead of breezes facilitated by cross ventilation, wide overhangs, brisole, lattice work of various kinds, and secondary skins or ornamental blocks. <clears throat> the last uh, dating to the Moorish tradition of Spanish peninsular architecture and all in the service of softening the harshness of the tropical sun. One of the early lessons I learned was to appreciate the layering of styles or moments of the architectural past. The priority I placed on preserving these details guided decision making by church authorities and mayors. That led, as we saw a minute ago, to my own incorporation of this traditional vocabulary into projects. And I used the sample of the <coughs> Church in Aguas Buenas uh, as paying homage to what is a tradition that we have been too ready to forget. And with it, unfortunately, forgetting our identity. Today I'm delighted to see a whole movement about a new generation of architects who hold our vernacular architecture in high esteem and seek to reconcile forward-looking designs with traditional Puerto Rican architecture by incorporating wide overhangs, trellises, and resources that can mitigate the rigors of the tropical climate. This new school of architectural thought serves as a large umbrella under which the architecture of such practitioners in Puerto Rico can find shelter. The search is on for the creation of a regional identity, a Puerto Rican identity in our case, that we may call an tropical identity for Puerto Rican and Caribbean architecture that will be able to compete with other regional styles. <clears throat> These works should be framed within the context not only of the current state of Puerto Rican architecture, but also in the recent history of our recent past. The corresponding state of the education of architecture in Puerto Rico becomes very relevant. My generation of architects was trained abroad primarily in the United States. It is not until 1966 that the first school of architecture is established at the University of Puerto Rico. Until then, architectural education and training was done outside of Puerto Rico. Initially, it was imported from Europe, 
were the generation of dominance and vultures. Casa Foranga vultures is what you're seeing here, were trained. The training of architects in Europe was displaced <coughs> by uh, training and educating architects in the United States. As such, the Vitor's astounding works, such as Casa Villaronga in Ponce, gave way to a new Americanized view of architecture. These new values concurring with the North American architectural values, incidentally learned from the European Bauhaus, focusing on the precepts of functionalist modernist architecture were likewise embraced in Puerto Rico. By the early 40s, Henry Klum had arrived in Puerto Rico, fresh from the office of Frank Lloyd Wright, and with him came Nutra's architectural social concern and his contribution to new school designs. These are some of, well, Nutra's drawings and the typical architecture. And what I'd like to signal here is that this becomes very confusing because on the one hand, you have this sort of tropical intentions of the drawing that become deadly architecture on the right. However, it's not all so deadly when you see that some of these other works that were done by him start reincorporating the overhangs, the trellises, the transparencies and the tropicalism. So that what you're seeing here is very clearly unresolved vectors that are inciting over our architecture. It's not until 1996, 30 years after the establishment of the first school of architecture, that the country's second school of architecture is born at the Polytechnic University. This space is accelerated only when only 13 years later, a third school of architecture is born at the Universidad Católica de Ponce just a couple of years ago in 2009. So as you can see, Puerto Rico has been starved for architectural education. Fortunately, it seems to be meeting now the, uh, or, or, or filling the void. But still, there is the search underlying it all of what is Puerto Rican architecture. The pace and the education of architects in Puerto Rico is further accelerated as now, only a couple of years later, two new schools of architecture in the making at the Anaheim Mendes University in Caguas and the Metropolitan University in Quebec. Within this traditional context, I arrived in Puerto Rico, recently graduated from Tulane, to work at the Institute of Culture in 1967, a decade before the establishment of the Colegio de Arquitectos in 1978. It is telling in this overview of the state of Puerto Rican architecture, it took the Colegio de Arquitectos to publish its first monograph, the Marvell work, in 2005, 27 years later. So the, the scope of what's happening in Puerto Rico in architecture has been almost like a wasteland. And the wasteland, which in my mind was, for my purposes, wonderful because it was very tolerant, uh, but a wasteland nevertheless. The sole focus of emphasis on North American architecture from Puerto Rico however, started waning. By the years I was president of the Colegio de Arquitectos in 1985 and 86, with the search of our identity through studies of our Spanish and European heritage and the comparable states of Caribbean architecture with forms such as the Ventana del Caribe in 1986, these concerns are further enriched by the academic studies of San Germán and Mayagüez, traditional vernacular architectures germinating at the Colegio de Arquitectos. It must be said that one of the most important architects in that evolution or, or in that search or in that work was architect for Jorge Rigal. 
All these factors questioning modern architecture are firmly established by the late 1980s. All the sculptural, <coughs> at best, architecture of the isolated object promoted by modernism <coughs> concurs with, of course, modern bu buildings being imploded, such as Brudillo, and different philosophies of architecture as defensible space and how do you deal with uh, plastic situations that can curb criminality, that can uh, you know, become resources to, to, do, uh, to build space. Once again, progressively more convincingly emerge the values of our vernacular architecture with its interior patios, cross ventilations, and the virtues of traditional doors with their multiplicity of options through louvers and glasses inserted behind postigos or rear panels. Here comes the resurgence of the ornamental blocks and the urban colonnades or soportales of our past. Minimalist modern architecture gives way to the rationalism of a new functionality. Now, one of the functional parameters was not what would fit somewhere, but how good it felt to be in it. And here you have traditional architecture translated in, and I have to make an excuse, this is an interior court. Uh, I didn't find a, uh, a slide that would show like, you know, in front of the, those have been in old San Juan, the uh, city hall that has the soportales, etc. The, the urban uh, galleries, uh, those are the elements that come to inspire the work that many years later, I don't know, already many years ago, because these are projects that are dating from really the 1960s, is the Rio Piedras terminal that we did many years ago. Before concluding, I would like to share, as an author, the difficulty <coughs> suffered in the near production effort of this uh, monograph. The process of coordinating the text with their corresponding authors, the editing, the translation, the graphic design, the proofreading, the photographing, the printing, and all of this coordinated, of course, through the Colegio de Arquitectos resulted in a monumental effort. It is very deceptive how a little book can be so difficult to produce. And this could not have been done without the unflinching efforts of my daughter, Maria Gabriela. Without her, it simply would never have been completed, or certainly not with the care and quality aspired. On concluding, I would like to share some of the images. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> this is, for those that are interested, the structure of the book. It has some essays. It has some projects that have been built, that are in process, that we consider experimental. It has the biographies, the uh, biographical notes. It you know, records the writings and awards. And it has then the chronology of the works. Uh, as I said, pretty much all 200 of them. And then the uh, sources of the photographs and the collaborators. <clears throat> These are interpretations of what is, in my mind, what we have inherited from our heritage of the transparencies, the openness, the pergolas. This, by the way, is a refurbished little center in a public housing project of Sierra Verde Sia. Now, this is, I think, where you then start putting all of these things together and you start seeing a path that is actually quite traceable between what we owe to Henry Klum and ultimately to Frank Lloyd Wright and the work that this is more recent that I have been doing, which is non-architecture. I mean, this is habitable space. You can't see a building. This is a, one of the early, early projects. It is the project of 
El Duque. And um, I guess it was sort of the project that told people that I was different and that I was looking for different things and that, you know, I was very concerned about creating space that really didn't have roofs. I was creating space that was important to have shadows and it was very important to have you can't really see them very well here, but there's a lot of mosaics that you see the seats. And to do that, it was really actually very, very laborious, very difficult. All those mosaics were done, because at that time there was nobody doing them in Puerto Rico, by one of our draftsmen, bless his soul, and uh, Rafi Dominguez. And uh, they, we had to convince the uh, <coughs> contractor to do it our way. But at any rate, you know, this is habitable space. You get wet, but it's very refreshing. You have shade. And ultimately, I mean, there are some spaces that are protected down below. I mean, this is a very large swimming facility. And of course, you have to put the mechanical equipment stored away. But it was certainly not right to store away people. And the whole idea of continuity of spatial alternatives and how you go in. I mean, th th there was a need uh, here actually to do this in Berms because it was a floodable area. So, and there was a, an existing pool that had to be to remain at a, at a given level. Uh, <coughs> so this is part of the statements. And of course, the tower is kind of interesting. It has two sets of stairs. So you never go back down the way you go up. So you can go up and down. And it becomes a very playful element, you know, humor in architecture, which was something that I think is totally devoid in modernism. There it is from a distance. Another house dating from 1986. As you can see down below here, there are some of the medio puntos. This was the before and after. And the limiting little fence that was very uncomfortable to the house was torn. Again, you start talking about the grills and you start talking about raising to let the hot air and the ventilation go through. And of course, this bungalow has an enormous debt with the traditional architecture of Puerto Rico. There on the right, you can see what happened to the little drawing on the left, or the, the photograph on the left, where learning from San Germán comes medio puntos. And, and you know, it was a fun house. I mean, it was so much fun that actually it was one of the resources that was used by the Polytechnic University whenever we had uh, activities and people came from the outside, they would borrow our house because it was interesting to, as a, as a, as a showpiece of what could be done in architecture in Puerto Rico. And I see Yvonne and I can't help but <laughs> share with you a wonderful story. At one of those outings, the president of the National AIA came to a party. And uh, we were serving little pasteles that we had had one of the maids do. And uh, he loved them. On his way out, because he had a meeting with the rest of the people that had come for the accreditation, he just simply took a bunch of them, wet as they were, and put them in his pocket. <laughs> to what? since she's here, Yvonne just screamed <laughs> with absolute amazement. And in a way, it you know, shows quite clearly how different we are and how much we all have to learn from each other. This is what was a little fence that got torn down. There are your Moorish traditions and your pergolas and the grill and the restricted space that becomes then just a habitable environment. 
close the presentation, I would like to leave you with some final thoughts on how I see the future of Puerto Rican architecture. I can only be very optimistic about the directions <coughs> Puerto Rican architecture is moving. There's a wonderful new crop of committed young architects. The new generation is turning out some remarkable works worthy of recognition in Puerto Rico and abroad. There are many names. I started putting them down, but I was afraid to leave some of the relevant ones out, so I took them all out. But believe me, there are a lot of people doing great things. The work is being published in architectural journals. The architecture schools are bringing in noteworthy foreigners, so a hundred of architecture students so our hundreds of architecture students are being exposed to the best architectural work around the world. There's a general view towards seeing the reality of globalization <coughs> as a resource rather than a limitation. It is clear Puerto Rico architecture is furthering an idiosyncratic identity. And I would like to think that maybe we have been instrumental in contributing to opening some doors to the development of that identity. From what I see happening now, I think we have. Thank you very much for sharing with me these thoughts. Good night. Um, well, it's a real honor to be here and to be able to speak at this event and to um, um, offer just a, f a couple thoughts really on the on the work of uh, Luis Flores um, more by way of an introduction to some questions in this discussion that we're, we're about we're about to have um, this is a, a book that was long overdue um, it's it's something of a well-kept secret in a way that has been let out of the Pandora's box uh, uh, through the through the publication that uh, Luis Flores is one of the greatest architects in, uh, in Puerto Rico. And part of why I think it's been uh, a well-kept secret is, is been, uh, has had to do with, with his modesty, with, with the fact that he has, um, you know, went about, he's gone about his business doing great architecture, but hasn't really spent a lot of time promoting himself uh, uh, as an architect, which is what a lot of the other architects that I think are less sophisticated than Luis, but are perhaps better known, um, you know, I think part of their uh, success has to do with with the with the amount of marketing that they've that they've put into uh, into into it. Um, <clears throat> just as a kind of um, Kind of personal note, I think that this question of place that Luis was was mentioning is really important, and and I know that literature is really important to him too. And um, there is a recent book that was published by an Indian writer called Solo. His name is uh, Ranadas Gupta, and it's not about India. It's not about England, where he was born. It's about Romania, out of all places, and it talks about the experience of of modernization and of modernity in Romania and how different it is to be cosmopolitan in a place that is not an obvious cosmopolitan place, that is not one of the great centers of industrialization, that is not one of the great centers of, of, um, of what we think of as cosmopolitanism. And when I first moved to Puerto Rico I, I, and, and had the great fortune of coming into contact with Luis, I had that, I had that singular experience of, of all of a sudden discovering, not, not having come from a particular cosmopolitan center myself, having come from Spain, which was somewhat of a backwater place, um, but I had that, 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 that uh, unique experience of discovering uh, a sense of cosmopolitanism that was unlike what I had experienced before, having, having traveled to places like New York or Paris or what have you, where, um, where cosmopolitanism is something that's, in a sense, taken for granted. Um, in, in the case of, of Puerto Rico, it's not something that's taken for granted. And, and Luis, in a way, uh, is somebody that embodied that sort of cosmopolitanism as something that requires a, a, a lot of work. Uh, and that is um, a kind of openness to the world. So. Um, 
I, I in a way want to resist the idea of calling Luis a Puerto Rican architect because in a sense he is a world architect um, and is, is one he is somebody that has that works in Puerto Rico with a certain kind of openness uh, to ideas and themes that are relevant to to all of us that are not just that are not just um, reducible to uh, to the weather uh, you know or the food that one uh, eats in Puerto Rico as good as it may be um, I think part of the cosmopolitanism that um, that he brings to to Puerto Rican culture and culture at large is um, is a way of um, of attending to things. He he uh, he focuses our attention on particular phenomena that we might have not uh, um, considered before. And I certainly experienced that when I when I first arrived in his house because I, I you know we did do one of the first parties for the uh, Politecnica in his house. And having spent, I think by that time I had spent maybe four or five months in, in Puerto Rico, and I had seen every hotel lobby there was to see, and uh, you know every beach there was to see, and I felt like I hadn't really kind of experienced Puerto Rico. And I think when I entered his house, and in a way his, his private world, and was able to engage in conversation with him, I really felt that I had entered a kind of the, the, the the core of Puerto Rican intellectual life, because I think more than just an architect, uh, Luis is, a, is 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 an intellectual uh, and a scholar, and and is someone that that nurtures that and and brings together people from really disparate fields uh, into conversation about the issues that are really relevant across culture beyond architecture, and. Um, you know, I think this question of inhabitable space, of the richness of, of space, um, his interest in the vernacular, his interest in the vernacular goes beyond vernacular buildings. It goes into vernacular song, vernacular uh, traditions of uh, uh, oral traditions. Um, and in all this, there is a kind of, there is a kind of optimism that is really enviable. I mean, there is a kind, there, you know, and, and that is contagious in some way, and, and that, is, that is unique to him. It's not really part of his generation, because I think his generation was, uh, uh, not all, but you know, it's hard to generalize, but to some degree defeatist um, you know, about the, the, the potentiality of a kind of re renewed uh, Puerto Rican culture, of a kind of resurgence. Uh, and, 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 and there is a kind of, you know, he kept the flame alive, I think, in some, to some degree. Uh, at least, uh, if he did not keep the flame alive uh, for his own generation, I think he certainly transmitted it to the next generation. And I think his, his work as a, as a teacher, um, I think, has that kind of brilliance, that he was able to um, be generous, you know, be generous with his time, be generous with his knowledge, and to invite students to really reconsider uh, what is possible. And, and that, that notion of, of, of kind of focusing on potential is something that really always struck me because he, I don't think he ever met a bad student. He, he always was talking about the potential of the student. You know, I'm like, but this guy is really not good. <laughs> but he was always, he always could find something in students that was redeemable and gave them the confidence. Often, you know, students that came from really a very poor um, intellectual backgrounds, they might have been economically advanced but had very little uh, intellectual background or um, uh, the other way around, we had some, some students that came from very uh, uh, financially deprived uh, backgrounds but who were uh, intellectually incredibly brilliant. Uh, so anyway, it, it didn't really necessarily have to do with, with the kind of traditional cuts that we uh, assume. And he was, uh, he was always pushing us not to kind of think about, uh, not, not to approach things with prejudice. And I think that, that notion of being unprejudiced is also something that he brought to architecture. And I think that's how he was able to get out of the, of the kind of modernist rut. You know, he, he spoke a little bit about this kind of fight with modernism that he had. 
And I think his opening to other forms of architecture, to history of architecture, uh, to vernacular traditions, had to do with this, and I don't know where, how he got this, but maybe we can ask him a little bit, um, uh, with this sense of being, of being unprejudiced. And, um, and asking one to reconsider one's assumptions. And somehow I wish that he had been less modest than he had uh, t taken us to his projects and shown us some of his works because I felt it was like a little bit late that I really discovered um, his built work. I, I, I had the good fortune of having the opportunity to talk to him many times. Um, but, you know, the kinds of really modest interventions that he did in some of these suburban uh, houses are really spectacular because they begin to have you reconsider the notion of the street, for instance. The relate these houses had been all blocked from the street. There was this sense of fear of the street that, that one would really be attacked if you had a house that was halfway open. And uh, he reintroduced a sense of a kind of confidence in uh, Puerto Rican culture of that you can, you can have a house without fences, you know, you can open your house to the street, you can tear down that wall. And, um, and so I think that there is a, that, that kind of courage is something to be applauded. It's not, it's not easy to find because everything is in a sense stacked, stacked against you. And in his urban projects like the UPR Press, you know, the sense of urbanity, of urban space, the, the, the ability to recuperate a sense of r the richness of light, the kind of in-between spaces, not the kind of super hot sun and, and dark shadow, but that kind of in-between space, um, I think is really key. And he talks about this in his writings also. I mean, there, some of them are included in this book, like the one about Hilbersheimer, uh, I think is particularly relevant. <coughs> And the other thing that I think is really incredible about his architecture, and I am sounding a little bit too positive here, so I, may, I better find <laughs> something to, uh, to say uh, that, is, um, that is perhaps more critical, but it's quite, quite difficult to actually, um, is the sense of, um, for example, the town hall and the bus terminal that he worked on for Dorado. I think that there is a sense of of monumentality in his work um, that is not about the size of the work, but it is about the richness of the experience that it brings to you. So that he would always, in his projects, um, attend to luxury, which is, which is a difficult thing to do in the context of architecture because Luxury always has these kind of class connotations, and um, you know, and and partly I think that's what part of the reason why all that 1900 architecture was was uh, thrown out the window because it was you know bourgeois architecture, and so that took a little bit of courage to, in a sense, look at that uh, at that architecture and say, you know, uh, without neglecting the fact that indeed this was uh, um, representative of a certain class, the kinds of lessons and the kinds of luxury that are here are not uh, necessarily something that can only be afforded through great wealth, but it's something that we can, uh, we can all partake in. And his public projects, I think, really have um, uh, really advanced that position with, with real elegance and, uh, and robustness. Um, lastly, just to finish up, I would just offer you a, 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 um, a, uh, a, an anecdote about faculty meetings, which, as you know, is the best way not to get anything done in the world. <laughs> so you set a bunch of faculty around, and, and we just go around in circles. And wh one of the things that Luis would do is he would actually get things done. <laughs> and he... he which was which is terrifying for, for, for faculty. Um, but he would do so because he was never afraid to speak truthfully uh, and to speak the truth. Um, and this was both inside and outside of faculty meetings. And that's really a, a quality and a, uh, of, of ca and, and a, and a character trait that is, that is very hard to find. And he, this, I think, has been a, a, a continuity in, in both his life and his work, is that he would never allow himself to uh, operate under any sort of false consciousness. And he would always 
say things as he saw them and welcome the debate that would ensue. But uh, it, it was never ever mean spirited. It was, and it was never personal for him. Um, it was always in the interest of a larger and greater good, like for instance, education. And so I was very pleased to hear him talk about education in Puerto Rico because this was really uh, the ultimate goal. And so he would, uh, he would force the faculty and, and, and in public debates, force politicians and, and what have you, to put their own personal interests aside and to make compromises in the interest of getting uh, the best institutions established, the best sort of education advanced um, that was that was possible. So I guess I, I only you know I'm, I'm again I'm honored to be here, and I would conclude by just thanking Luis for helping us rediscover uh, a more, uh, uh, if I may quote you, habitable uh, Puerto Rico, and and I may follow with a few questions uh, in, in the course of our discussion. Thank you. I just had two um, points or two pieces of information for you to share. One is that Luis's uh, acceptance speech to the Henry Klum Award was, I think, called the dissenting voice. If any of you have read Supreme Court decisions, there's always a majority and there's always a dissenting voice. I think Luis was very, very keen in continuing the tradition of the dissenting voice. And this at first struck me as odd because as Jorge mentioned is that he was not interested in just going along with the flow. The dissenting voice, in my opinion today, is that it has to exist. It has to happen, and I think that uh, the architecture that Luis presents is an architecture of dissenting. It is necessary architecture, and it's also um, part of the debate that Jorge was talking about. We can't have everybody agree, and I think Luis contributes to the debate by having that dissenting voice. And the other issue or point I wanted to bring up is that the Caribbean has been historically the crossroads of the world uh, where cultures have arrived and crashed and re-flourished and I think it is Luis's work where some of those cross currents have actually intersected and he's trying to capture them as it were. Um, I'm reminded because of the openness and the literary references and I go back to the original metaphor of Luis as the master gardener is that he sees his architecture as being a garden, a garden of delight, a garden of spaces and a garden of thought. And I think that is the ultimate job for the architect is to be a gardener. Well, with this idea of uh, the dissenting voice, you know, I, I, it's interesting. I think you nailed it there because there, there, I, I think in your work, Luis, there is this sense that there, you would not have a voice unless you had something to dissent <laughs> against. But they're always, you're always embattled <laughs> against something. And in that sense, you know, for example, with this church in Aguas Buenas, which I, I think has some redeemable qualities. I, think, I, I, I can see where you are, you know, completely opposed so to So you it. disagree. But, but your idea that it, would, that, would, that, that it should be demolished, I thought, was a little bit, you know, overstating the case. And thank you, Luis. Thank you again. Thank you.